Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for sticking around, and thank you for having me, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm, uh, I was asked earlier, <laughs> you're the projector guy. Um, no, I'm, I'm Jens. Hi. <laughs> But um, I am going to talk about a very initial research project that we have uh, dubbed uh, Navigating the Intangible Spatial Driven Design Modeling and Architecture. And it's a project that uh, came out through a conversation between myself and my colleague Ryan Hughes, um, the guy in the middle. We both work at the Architectural School in Aarhus where we work with um, the various digital fabrication facilities that they have acquired as of late. Um, and it was at a time where Cornel Canards from TU Leuven, no, KU Leuven, was doing a research stay at Aarhus, and we had a few conversations over a couple of years, and uh, we started to sort of debate or talk about different projects we were doing and that we had been doing in the past. Um, at that time, um, Ryan and I was working on autonomous data capturing th with the use of autonomous uh, robotic platform. Um, we signed some NDA, so I can't show any photos of it, uh, but you can ask me questions about it in a coffee break, and I'll gladly tell you what that project was about. Um, and when we started to talk about that project with Cornel, he mentioned that he had done this project uh, called Field Station um, as part of a, a workshop at the Technical University in Berlin. Um, where they were producing data like this. Um, so everything was graph-based like we've seen in a lot of projects today. Uh, and also in other research by uh, Luis Fergada, as was mentioned before by Tomas, and also a lot of the stuff that you did. Um, and, and also by um, uh, Carlos Arti, who will give a lecture tomorrow, which I look forward to a lot. Um, so based on that conversation and, and the knowledge at hand through other research, we started to formulate this very uh, open research question. Uh, how can we develop a near real-time data capture and visualization method, method which can be used across multiple scales in various architectural design processes, meaning ranging from analysis of buildings to uh, analysis of urban systems. So. Um, what I'm essentially going to talk about is the process of, of data capturing the device itself, which are already described in a lot of research before, so I'll brush over those quite quickly. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how, how we're processing the data and how we're embedding it in, within a CAD environment. And then uh, talk about various visualization methods and how they are leading towards uh, abstract uh, applications within architecture. Um, so the process is pretty straightforward. Uh, we have made a little handheld device, which I'll show in a little bit. Uh, so you can go out with the device uh, and capture data. Then you can process it, you can visualize it, and you can interpret it. And then if you feel like that there's some data missing, you can then go out and then recollect. So you have this uh, adaptive sampling of the environment that you're collecting data for. Um, and the device itself is, is, as many others before me, based on the Arduino platform. Uh, we use an Arduino R3 with an Ethernet shield to uh, log all the data. And then we use very low cost sensors, uh, such as this MQ2 gas sensor, a DHT uh, sensor, uh, which is for, used to capture humidity and um, temperature, it's written right below, um, and a sound sensor. And we then, in order to get this into a CAD environment, we needed to attach some type of location to the data that we assembled. So we used this uh, GPS module, which uh, can give us a various, uh, or a myriad of different information, ranging from altitude, longitude, and latitude, which are the three ones that we're interested in. We could also get information about uh, how many um, satellites were tracking us and other Big Brother type data, which was kind of scary. Um, so this is our very hacked, not very designed uh, portable sensor kit, um, which worked fine. Um, it doesn't look that nice, but uh, it's the first uh, very crude model. Um, and one thing there is to say about uh, going out and, and capturing data with these very low cost sensors. Thomas uh, touched upon it 
quite quickly with saying they're a pain in the ass, uh, meaning that um, some of the data sometimes become jagged and you have spikes and you have, um, so you have, it becomes spiky in some regards, like the data that we have here. So when we captured data, we wrote the code in such a way that each data point that we sampled for had a subsequent sample of, I think we, it was, I think around 100 or so, and then we averaged that out to try and remove spikes within a data uh, sample. Uh, and then that would then smooth out the data so we had a more reliable uh, data sample instead of having peaks and valleys uh, sort of willy-nilly through our data capturing. So the, <clears throat> the Arduino device uh, would is at the moment, and that's some, some stuff that we're trying to uh, develop uh, as of now. Uh, right now, it's, it's basically just giving us a text file that we can then read. Um, however, as we set out in the research question, we would like to move towards a more real-time data sampling and visualization. Um, and I'll show you in a little bit how we could do that. So for now, we're sticking with these text files. Um, and then the question is, how can we map that back into a CAD environment so that we can start to do site-specific analysis? Um, we did a um, quick uh, test case with some students at the School of Aarhus uh, in relation to a pavilion that they wanted to make uh, for this site in uh, what's called Venelus Park in Aarhus, Denmark, uh, where they wanted to try and embed the pavilion with information of site-specific parameters. Um, so we looked at how we could process the data that we had collected uh, through um, our favorite weapon, uh, rhino, rhino and grasshopper. So we take all the data and import it into that. And then in order to get an XYZ position, we use what's called uh, equidistant cylindrical projection. Um, this is also described in further detail in, in the paper. Um, However, using this methodology has uh, a tendency to distort the, the positioning of, of your locations, but we are in trying to mitigate that through the way in which we visualize the, the, the data, which I'll talk a little bit about in a couple of slides. Um, but at the end of the day, we managed to get the data in uh, in such a way that we have an X, Y, Z coordinate, which is very, very important for the further processing of what we wanted to do. Um, and um, here we have all the gathered points uh, inside of Rhino. And the way in which we t choose to process the data is by read, uh, writing to a bespoke uh, voxel modeler that I have written. Uh, in this case, and, and all the visualizations you're going to see today, it's made on a three meter spacing, which means we have around 10,000 points in, in, in this sample. And what we can essentially inside, and oh, sorry, uh, what's really important about how this is written is how we can then locally structure the data for making some type of visualizations. Um, as you can see, I don't know if it's clear here, but the, basically all the points are clustered within neighborhoods as well, so that, <coughs> sorry, uh, so that they're structured within a box uh, like this. Um, and the reason for that is it's been uh, written so that it can be used for uh, marching cubes, uh, which is an isosurfacing algorithm. There's others like marching tetrahedra or surface nets, et cetera. Um, we used marching cubes because it's very uh, uh, generic and it's, it, it's very accurate and, and the algorithm is fairly easy to write if you know Paul Burke's uh, website. Uh, the reference for that is also in the paper. Um, all this data is not explicitly stored, meaning that we haven't made everything as lines and points uh, in several arrays and lists. We just have it as ID pointers. Uh, so we have arrays that then just stores ID so we can start to do callbacks and then read things quite flexibly. Um, what uh, the marching cubes is doing is essentially a spatial contouring algorithm. Um, here exemplified through a 2D example. So essentially what you give uh, the algorithm is uh, an ISO value or a contouring value. Uh, and then it checks whether or not the value which is attached at each point within the spatial grid uh, which are called scalars, 
Um, and each of those scalars is then checked as to whether or not it's above or below um, the contouring value. And then it, in a simple 2D case, it draws a line. And then when you go to the next box, then that will also draw a line and it will start to make uh, a, a geometry based on an above or below value. Um, uh, so that's also described in further detail at the, in the Paul Berg reference that we have referenced for the paper. Um, so what is in, in part the intelligence of what we have and, and why I stated that there's a high importance on the XYZ coordinate of the points that, that we are, uh, are making is this very, very simple formula, uh, which basically takes um, a point position in space and then maps it to an ID based on its XYZ coordinate and a little bit of knowledge of uh, minimum and, and maximum values of the voxel field that we have made. Um, this could have been done in a different way as well uh, had we written the voxel field as a three-dimensional array instead of a single array. And the reason why we wrote, wrote it as a 1D array instead of a 3D array is essentially just um, for a more legible code. Um, and therefore, we had to make this formula a little bit more complex. But I would say that it makes up for the legibility of the, the code when you, when you sit and read it. So this is a, a diagram showing what I wanted to talk about with the distortion of the, the mapped data points is that they're already being read to a fixed grid of points. So you're already distorting the points in a way. So um, you can see the gray point in the middle, that's the point that we want to map, and then that's being mapped to the point in the top left. Um, and then that is then assigned a value, which we can then contour, and then you get a volumetric representation, which in a way is at the core of what we can do with this system. Um, so just to show you the, how fast we can map values uh, to the system, I have made this animation. This is a real-time screen capture. It's not been sped up. Um, and it's based on the XYZ coordinate of the point that I'm moving around, uh, writing data to the one of the 10,000 points. Um, and the reason why it looks a bit jagged is because it's snapping to the three meter grid. It's not because it's slow. Um, so a second feature that we have with, um, within this voxel field is that we can start to diffuse values and start to then see in, in interplay between data uh, and then also maybe remove the need for going and resampling because you can start to make projections of the sample data that you have already gathered. Um, and we're using a very classic diffusion formula based on the network um, of, of, agent or of neighborhoods. And um, here's just to highlight how that looks. This is, uh, again, mesh representation with the same uh, contouring value. So you can see how it, it grows and, and propagates through. Um, so what does this all mean for visualization? And one of the very uh, classical ways of, of showing data is through um, maps uh, of, of a color gradation that means something. Um, this is uh, sound data where the turquoise value is high and white is low. Um, and sometimes these may be static and so then you need to sample at one place and then you need to make another one and sample there. Because we have this within uh, our voxel modeler, we can then uh, sample where we like and it all adapts as, as we go. So you get this dynamic visualization method where you can actively then choose to show where, where do I want to show the data and what do I want to see. And, and this is again uh, acting real time, uh, hence the low quality of the, 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 the animation uh, because it's done just with a screen capturing software. Um, and here is just to describe what the diffusion means. So as I showed in the diagram, uh, dif diffusion acts in all directions, so X, Y, and Z. So therefore, we can start to see how um, things analyzed in, uh, at a higher level may affect what's going on at a lower level within the voxel field. Um, 
So here's how the diffusion propagates over time. And you can start to see sort of the interplay of data and how they affect each other. You still have the highest concentration here at the starting point, or not concentration, but the highest sound uh, here. But you can see how uh, other layers of the voxel field may affect this layer as such. So here is um, an example of the marching cubes where we're basic, we're contouring uh, sound values. And the bigger the mesh is, um, so to say you can see it sort of bubbling up and down. So the smaller it is, the closer we are to where the sound was sampled. Uh, and also that's the highest value. So then the further we get away, you have this uh, diffusion of, of, of the, the sound. And then you can start to make these volumetric representations. And what's interesting is you can start to see how if we see the data not as static, but if we see it as uh, a dynamic entity that we can control through the fusion, you can start to make visualizations like this. This is also real time, as was the other one. Um, and then you can see how it, and it's all visualized at the same scalar value, but as a function over time. Um, what is interesting about that is you can start to have different sample values that you can then sample with. Uh, here exemplified through another example. Um, this is not real time. I've had to make this through uh, uh, just uh, 300 frames that I've then combined together in a little animation. Um, and finally, what we can then start to look at and, and start to address is sort of the volumetric representation of data, uh, which we hypothesize could be used as uh, I'll get to that a little bit in the conclusion, but essentially it can start to become these zoning models uh, so we can start to make architecture that avoids or sh uh, shields itself from, uh, it could be noise pollutants, it could be pollutants, um, and, and et cetera. Uh, and we can start to see what their uh, volumetric representation is, or we can start to explore them as a spatial expression by simply doing some very simple numeric manipulations to the field by doing what I've called capping it. Um, so, as I already mentioned, uh, we can start to use these as zoning models, which is not a new concept that was already thought up in 1916 for New York uh, to enable daylight to come down to the streets. Uh, this can be sort of a 2.0 version of that where we can start to then have volumetric representations that tell us how to situate things on site or age, uh, aids us in situating things on site. Um, and then also the platform is quite open. We can read and write to it without any data whatsoever. Uh, here's just a couple examples of how that is done with uh, CFD data and how we again, this is operating on I think 15,000 points. Uh, again, real time uh, sample that we're, we can actively move around. So it give us a sense of design flexibility because we can actively subsample things. And then because we have the data inside of this uh, framework, we can also start to then make real time CFD and visualizations uh, or animations, I mean. Um, so there is a high flexibility within a very rigorous system considering, consisting of this um, spatial grid. Um, and I'm at the end now, and essentially what we're going to do in, in the future is, as I've already mentioned, we're going to try and focus on having a live feedback to try and see if we can actually achieve this uh, live connection between uh, real and digital and, and see what type of data we're assembling. Um, test workflow in other data settings like the one with the CFD and try and, and bridge gaps and make other types of uh, flexible visualization tools and mechani mechanisms. Um, and then we're gonna try and test it with other modes of uh, data collection. As I already mentioned, we had, have already looked into autonomous data, uh, robotic data collection. It could also be attaching these modules to um, drones or a dog or a cat, I don't know. Um, but trying to look into those uh, those things as well, and then just a few technical things that, that we're going to try and do as well. Uh, embed uh, the system with data clustering so we can start to do callouts uh, in different methods or in different ways, 
And then also, like, we have the 3D spatial contouring that make that in, uh, in 2D. And uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jens. Um, is there any questions from the audience? All right. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have a very quick uh, question to clarify something for me. Are you using arrays or associative arrays? Because it was a bit confusing for me oh, when you started um, talking about IDs. We're using 1D arrays. OK. Um, and when I said 3D arrays, I just mean with where you can have an x, y, z coordinate. So to get technical, it's either we just have an i loop or an i, j, k that. loop. Um, have you considered using associative arrays for this? No, because I haven't heard of them before. <laughs> okay. You can tell me about them over coffee. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I had just a very quick clarification type of question. Could you talk a little bit more about how you're transferring the method to the applications you, you mentioned? Like in particular, I was kind of interested in the setback idea of how your, your, the, the technique that you described, how does, that does apply to the daylight access on public streets. Um, we, it's only something, that, as I said, this is very initial research. Uh, and we have talked about how we can use these different modes of visualization. Um, and as of now, we haven't gone through a full design process uh, with our own gathered data and, and with a use case uh, where I could then show uh, how we would go about using the volumetric data to then have a, a certain relationship with contextual data through form instead of through numbers. Um, so unfortunately, I can't really answer the question except that we'll, we have uh, new uh, research projects uh, coming in within the same field where we might end up applying it, uh, those techniques. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.